All right, well, good morning. I'm James again, just to remind you. Now, you're going to find out why we have the other panelists. We've got a great selection. We know you all have a lot of questions. It was obvious, the excitement, the hands shooting up in the air. If you have questions for our panelists, please make your way to the microphone here in the middle of the room. So everyone can hear the question and everyone can hear the answer. So thank you for that. Ramona is now gonna introduce our esteemed panelists. Thank you, James. Good morning, everybody. Great for you to stay and after our uh, keynote speaker, an excellent session there. So beginning on my far uh, left is Dr. Randy Cantrell. Dr. Cantrell with the University of Florida, a housing specialist. He's uh, also worked with uh, NAHB, National Association of Home Builders. His specialty areas, retrofits, uh, green building, uh, energy performance. He has uh, driven all the way from Gainesville to be here with us today, so we thank him for taking time out. Next, Dr. Cantrell, we have uh, Mr. Gary Cook, Progress Energy. You're a person to ask questions about financing, um, alternatives, and incentives. Next to Mr. Cook is Mr. Richard Duncan. Richard is a Sustainable Floridian graduate. He is also a homeowner who has installed uh, PV on his home and will be able to speak with you and share his experience about what he's done and how he's actually done it. Then we have Mr. John Ferrari from Eco Asset Solutions. All the buyers are in here, so I'm just giving quick introductions of these folks. John uh, is with uh, Dwell Green, has experience in green building, energy efficiency. His company has done a lot with PACE, uh, residential commercial programs to PACE. We have Dr. Langwell seated next to Mr. Ferrari. She has already been well introduced. Then we have Mr. Sam Moore. For those of you, uh, he may not have been in our program brochure, but Sam is a project director with the Planet Green Group. They are a local company here in Orlando. They have an office. They also have one here in Largo. And they've been doing a lot of uh, local projects in Dunedin and throughout Pinellas County. And then we have Mr. Jeremiah Rohr, Solar Soil Institute. Jeremiah is a lead instructor, education, manufacturing, engineering, construction, and project management. So he will share his technical expertise about solar installations within the county. So, I can get my card straight. The opening question for our panelists, we'll have each one of you answer this question. In your opinion, where should Pinellas residents best spend their money on energy retrofits? And we'll start with Dr. Cantrell. Um. Thank you all for being here today. I, I think certainly you would want to take a look at having some sort of a, an examination of your home, whether it's through a, a free program or whether you have to pay. But to, to go in and to, uh, to guess where to start is probably uh, happenstance. So I would definitely get a, an evaluation of your home as much overall as you can of the whole house picture. And I would certainly think that sealing your ducts, air sealing your ducts, any sort of joints, any places where your house may possibly be leaking would be a, a nice starting point as well as your insulation, but those are just very generic, probably less expensive options, but I would certainly like to see what your whole house looks like, and you saw some of that in some of the footage earlier this morning. All right, Mr. Cook. Okay. Thanks for inviting us here today. Um, I would probably start out, if you're in Progress Energy's territory, which I'm sure most of you are, with a uh, free home energy check. Uh, one thing that we'll evaluate is the duct system. Uh, that's very important. As Dr. Langell had pointed out, 42% of your energy bill each month in a residential home is gonna reflect either air conditioning or heating. Um, unfortunately, in Pinellas County, the, the code only calls for aluminum tape uh, to seal all your joints, connections, uh, so forth on your duct system. Mastic material is extremely important. I know a gentleman asked earlier about the blower door performance testing. Uh, after the home energy check, we will actually schedule the duct test for you. Uh, we have uh, contractors in the area that have been trained with the blower door. That test is $60. We pay for 30 of that $60. The contractor will come out and perform the negative pressure testing on the home and find all those leaks in your duct system and then Progress Energy will pay for the first $150 of repairs. And Dr. Langell once again had mentioned most of your leaks are coming out of your air handler. If it's as simple as sealing up an air handler and maybe a few other joints, you know, you're talking about uh, Progress Energy 
foot in the bill for the entire $150 of those repairs. So I would say duck systems. Richard? Yes, good morning. Um, I'm Richard Duncan, AKA Joe Homeowner. Um, I live in a 1,400 square foot, 1959 block house, flat roof. Ductwork is hanging from the ceiling, not in the ceiling. So right now I can't do attic insulation. But there are a lot of other things you can do and consider this to be not just uh, and a simple Im implementation. This is a ground floor, a pyramid structure. We do low hanging fruit to start with, things you can do. Conservation, as uh, the good doctor put it, is probably your best and first effort. Do all your lights, do your insulation, do the things you can do first as a homeowner. Living on a budget, I live on a budget. So I do what I can do, but over time, that way it's not seen as an extraordinary expense because it's spread out, and that's probably the most important thing for a homeowner to do. All right, thank you, Richard. John? Yeah, I guess I would also add to that. I guess I'm also here as a homeowner, I think, as um, all of you probably are, but I would say really uh, it's about awareness. So I would say get smart in this area about uh, what is free, as you've heard, or um, what's highly subsidized, and then I would look at at those rebate programs and at the tax credits and just to be certain that that what you're doing is going to get you the maximum bang for the buck because I have actually um, seen opportunities. I actually uh, live in Sarasota County and so with one of our programs you're able to actually dip into five um, different buckets for one improvement. And so I would just say you know take the time to get educated about what incentives are out there, and I think that that will help you prioritize. But I think as far as the items on my own home, I can agree with everybody here, is that the uh, tightening you know, of the envelope, the uh, lighting, and I also have uh, three teenagers, and so a, a tank with hot water system was actually dramatic. And so those types of things have just had uh, a dramatic impact on our life. Thank you, John. Dr. Langwell? Everything so far, complete agreement with, um, if you're looking at that $50 solution, that $50 solution really is, is to start with those compact fluorescent bulbs. Um, not to say that everyone has 50 of them in their houses, but start there. Uh, my second step, um, this is just in addition to what everyone else said, would really be to look at that attic for a couple hundred dollars and, and maybe that $500 price point, you can look at radiant barrier and or adding insulation to get up to an R38. And then when you go to that next generation, which might be that $5,000 step, uh, you're looking at the air conditioning equipment. So all of those things do usually have rebates. You're coming here, you're filling out an evaluation, you're getting an LED bulb. So that's your first step. Um, so the next few can be easy do it yourself and go on from there. All right, thank you. Sam? I, I think I'm gonna find that Dr. Langwell is very difficult to follow every time, so. <laughs> but I, uh, I agree that um, with everybody so far, and uh, one of the things that we've tried to do at Planet Green Group is to, uh, is to look at, at everybody and, and really wanna to try to engage them on a path to zero. And it, it might not be something that you can ever get to, it might be not you know, something you don't wanna to get to, but um, in getting on that path to zero, it can start with little simple things, fixes that you can do, as she showed in some of her slides with the, you know, sealing the, uh, the gaskets and things like that. And then, and then really just engage the, the process as you go. So as you can make improvements and you can do those things, go ahead and do them. And I think that everybody will find that they have a different tolerance for how much they want to engage that process and the different things that they want to do. So yes, doing the insulation and checking. And one of the things that that I've noticed is that there's so many people that will, that will come into your home and they'll try to sell you a whole lot of different things to do and, and make a lot of claims as to uh, energy savings and paybacks and returns and so forth. And, and, and one of the things that we've looked at and, and trying to implement with a lot of the homeowners is an energy monitoring system. Uh, pretty inexpensive way to uh, be able to show what's happening. And so when you start to get on the, uh, you know, on our, what we call path to zero, 
by looking at the monitor, it makes you more aware every day of, of what's happening and what you're using. You know, the power, power company sends you a bill once a month, and you get it, you look at it, you pay it, you put it away, you never look at it again. But when it's in your face and you have that, that instant feedback, you see how much you're spending, you see when you've left lights on and when things are doing. So little things like, I can't remember to go and turn the, you know, chase the kids around and turn the lights off after them. So maybe a timer or an occupancy switch in the bathroom, little things like that where, where things get left on make a big difference. Thank you, Sam. Jeremiah? Oh, well, I obviously have to agree with everybody down the line. Uh, there's lots of little things that you can do. And, and once you've, you've progressed through those things and, and sealed up your house and that kind of thing, it really is time to look at things like appliances and, and where your energy is consumed. Um, you know, one of your, one of your big uh, energy users be, beyond uh, heating and air conditioning is your hot water system. So a good solar hot water heater is, is, has a very fast payback in the state of Florida. If you look at uh, you know, energy consumption and looking at renewable energies, you have to look at what's available to your, in your environment. Uh, you look at places in the Midwest, they have lots of wind. In, in other places, they have hydro and they have, they have uh, you know, geothermal things. Florida has an abundance of sunshine. And we can, we can heat water very easily with, with uh, sunshine. It's a very simple concept. Uh, leaving your hose out in the backyard, it gets very hot, right? So, I mean, that concept is a very simple concept, and solar hot water heating is, is certainly a very uh, fast payback on it and its return on investment. Um, then you can step up into the sex and the sizzle, which is photovoltaics and things like that. Uh, th those things do, that technology is coming along dramatically, and if you want to step up into that next level beyond the conservation things, which is you absolutely have to do first. Uh, get into your get into your uh, alternate energy programs and really start to look at them. I mean, that, there's a lot of things out there that can help. Thank you, Jeremiah. All right, several have mentioned, and of course, Dr. Langwell in her presentation mentioned uh, the blower door test, the home energy audit. Let's go into that a little bit further. What exactly is that process? What kind of cost are we looking at? And how do we make sure that the people that are coming and knocking on the door saying I'm going to save you lots of energy. How do we vet those people? Can you go into that a little bit deeper? I'll open that to the whole panel. Sure, I can probably go first on that one. Um, with my dwell green hat on, I, I would say that you want to you know, look at the company that's going to uh, look at the whole house solution, because um, if you're going to have somebody come in um, anyways, they should be able to talk to you about energy, water, quality of life. Um, insurance benefits, which is obviously one of our big things here. Um, you know, certifications, anybody who's going to be doing these blower door tests, you want to see if they're uh, ResNet certified uh, or BPI. Um, and so these are regulated industries, so to speak, and so people should be qualified. Um, and again, they shouldn't be trying to sell you anything other than that intelligence, right? Because that's the way we look at it. So, what, and they should give you a really good. Um, you know, I would say uh, action lists just to say that this is what you ought to do first because there is a certain chain of events, right? Because as we heard, if you sealed your attic but you didn't do all your bracing beforehand for your insurance benefits, you, then um, you've made it so much more difficult now because you'd have to basically take all that blown sealed insulation out in order to actually get to the points of contact that you'd have to undo your bracing. And so th there's an optimized, um, I guess a checklist, if you would, you know, or a sequence of events that, that you should follow. And um, any of these consultants coming into your house, you know, again, should be looking at it with the whole house and a, a whole body type of analogy, because it is all going to be, you know, interrelated. Thanks. All right. Anybody from the audience have any questions? Don't forget to use the microphone in the center aisle. You can walk up and start to ask questions, if you would. The microphone in the center aisle, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, you do. What does the bracing mean? I mean, you said something, and I don't know what that means if I go back to it. I sure, have a very yeah. loud Could you repeat the question for us, please? So the, the question the was, what does the bracing mean? mean? I mean you said and, and, and I, I touched very briefly on building it. hardening. And so one of the things that we have in the state is hurricanes, as you know. And as 
building code has improved over time, we now require more structural integrity to the homes. And so older homes may not have the appropriate gable end bracing and or hurricane straps to hold that roof on in a major storm event. I recently got my insurance update, the, the annual quote, and it was $7,000, and I about fell out of my chair. Um, and Stacy in my office looked at me and she said, what are, you, what are you nuts, what's going on here? And so she reached out to get additional insurance quotes, and one of the folks that the, the insurance companies did is they said, well, have you had the building improved upon? And I said, absolutely, I did a whole house retrofit. Uh, well, we need to come out and do an inspection. And if you have this list of things done, it's a $500 savings a year here, a $200 savings a year here. And I said, well, send me that list uh, so I can see what you're looking for. And indeed, they were going to be looking for hurricane straps, and I have spray foam insulation, so they would not be able to see them. So there was no point in me paying for the inspection for someone to come out and see something that, that they wouldn't be able to sign off on. But there are opportunities, and we don't always think about insurance is a cost of living. We pay that every month on the mortgage sometimes or, or pay it every year, and so there are opportunities there. Now, Stacy, at the same time, came to me last month, and she showed me her electric bill, which was $500. And she has a teenage son who is a senior in high school and a 20-something daughter that has moved back into the house. And she said, we really need to fix this. And I said, okay, we'll come over and we'll, we'll do a blower door test. We'll find the leaks, we'll fix it. And as I'm sitting there, you know, I'm drinking cider because I like cider, she's drinking a beer. And uh, her son leaves to go fishing, and he left his light on, his TV on, everything in his bedroom on when he left. And so something that we all didn't mention in that first question was our own behavior. And our own behavior of leaving those things on is really impacting those energy bills. And so we have to remember to do that. And if we don't wanna to remember to do it, we can always put in the motion sensors so that our house will remind us to do those things. Any more questions? Oh, there we go. Go ahead, sir. Um, yes, these are great suggestions, but for example, I had the Progress Energy person come out and unfortunately my house that was built in 91 has those nice cathedral ceilings and so they couldn't tell me anything about my attic or even when I consider possible options of how I might add insulation in there. I did some research and tried to find, you know, there were some products maybe that perhaps could be sprayed in, but short of pulling down the drywall, can you have, you know, do I have any suggestions? You know, I, didn't, I really don't know how to get there or how to get the information. And unfortunately, that is, a, uh, that is a problem along with some of the homes built in the 40s and 50s that have flat roofs before the advent of air conditioning. Um, there are some fixes for flat roofs, but with the uh, cathedral ceilings, what the builders are doing is laying the battered insulation into the ceiling and then putting the drywall up, and uh, there's no access whatsoever. So. It's a problem. You have two different options. Uh, one would be to go on top of the roof. So they do make an aftermarket spray, depending on the type of roofing that you have, that would give you that equivalent radiant barrier. So I'm not familiar with the cost, but they do make spray on reflective type mica chips. The other option that we've seen, and this was a friend of mine, they purchased a house in uh, Hyde Park. It was one and a half story. So they really were hot up in that half story upstairs and they were able to do a rigid foam and then they had to again fur and do drywall on top of that. So it wasn't an inexpensive option, um, but it was a way to get some additional insulation up there. Please, let's use the, the microphone in the center aisle. That would help us with the camera and the filming. We really appreciate that. You can go ahead and form a line there. That'll be great. Yes, sir, thank you. I guess my question would be to Jeremiah Aror. Uh, what, how about putting the solar panels uh, in the backyard on a, uh, as opposed to having it on the roof? Sure, sure. Any, anywhere you can find a solar window. Your solar window is basically, you know, you have the sun coming up and going down in the evening, and January to June or July, that, that, that opening that sees the sunshine. Uh, on, on, a, on a consistent basis throughout the day and throughout the year. 
anywhere you can do that. We can put panels all over the place. We're, we're working on a, a, a PV system that's going out in a, in, at a church. They just have a big field in the backyard. And we're going to ground mount that system and, and route it into the, into the, uh, the electrical system of the, of the church. Um, anywhere we can put them. Uh, they don't always have to be, you know, usually the nicest spot is right above the front door and, and most women don't want a big solar collector over your front door. So we have to be creative sometime and figure out where we can put these things. Um, and, but we're quite capable. Obviously, the more distance, especially on a thermal system, and the more distance you get, the more heat loss you're going to have just in travel. Uh, same with electrical systems. The more distance there is, the, less, the more loss you're going to have. But we can factor those things into it. And uh, there's all kind of ways that we can be very creative for pool heating next to your swimming pool or on a garage or on an outbuilding of some sort or we'll fabricate it in. Some people just lay them on the grounds. But, you know, you can do that too. So there's a variety of options in that area. Thank you. You have a question. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm a former St. Pete Times reporter, and when I hear about roofs, um, I think about the least turn. I know this is a little off subject, but it is sustainability. And uh, this is a feisty little bird that does its best to nest, but it's been crowded off our beaches. And the only place they're having much success now is on white gravel roofs. So the problem there is a lot of these roofs are being replaced with dark roofs. And usually this is on commercial buildings, but on a flat roof, if you could put small, uh, you know, white gravel or even, I don't know about sand as a practicality, but since there are a lot of people here to do with building and sustainability, I just like to have the idea out there that any time uh, that we can provide habitat for these birds on our roofs, it would be great if you could just keep them in mind. Thank you. So the question about this is, um, where are we going with gravel roofs? Um, I'm hearing that some people are moving some people are moving away from gravel roofs because of course wind moves that gravel into all sorts of places. Is that still a, uh, an industry yeah, option or are we getting away from that? No, I think what you'll find in a lot of the commercial buildings is that uh, a lot of the owners are starting to look at energy retrofits and that's one of the places that they're that they're looking to. And so um, some of the uh, terminology torch down modified roofs or uh, in some of the asphalt, um, roofs are, were dark color, and they do absorb a lot of heat and, and reflect or transfer that into the building. And, and uh, you know, it is a big energy expense. But I think a lot of the building owners are now looking at um, doing roof coatings, and it's, uh, different types of materials used, but cool roof coatings where they are white. Um, there's even ones that go right over the gravel and then seal it down and lock it, and it, it waterproofs the roof and creates that. Uh, you know, that white reflective roof coating. There are other colored silver colors that they're using, but primarily it's, it is a white colored roof. And I, I think you'll find as we go forward, more and more building owners, um, instead of spending the millions of dollars to replace the roof, are uh, getting the same type of warranty out of doing a, um, a waterproof coating that is a reflective coating. It's a lot less, costs them a lot less money. And uh, again, could provide, you know, habitat areas for the, the types of birds and so forth. The, the there, okay, are, there are some other options out there. You know, there, there are plenty of people that are putting uh, sod roofs on homes and things like that in, in the green building field, uh, earth shelters and things like that, that that actually have grass on the roof. I mean, this is a, a plausible methodology, and it's used all over the world at the present time. Okay, Gary, you wanted to comment? That's exactly what I was going to mention also concerning the green roofs and the commercial industry. And actually, Progress Energy, for our commercial customers, we do provide an incentive for those uh, commercial buildings to go with a green roof. Um, one of the concerns, obviously, though, is the weight of, of building that green roof. Uh, as long as the stru structural integrity is sound, uh, that can be done, and there are incentives for it through our programs. All right. Thank you, Gary. We have a question from the audience. Uh, yeah, as a lay person, you know, it's really scary hiring contractors. I've had good luck, and I've had some bad luck, even when I've checked to see they were licensed. And, you know, one woman talked about well, what's a hurricane strap. Is there a list um, on the Internet, or maybe you all have available, of the, the order in which we should make sure we do all these things so we don't run into the problem of having insulation that the insurance company can't see? Um, you know, I want to do all these things, but I'm afraid because I've been burned by contractors. And, you know, where do we go? 
Dr. Langwell, I think you might be able to provide some insight. Un unfortunately, it's different for everyone, so a list that might work for your house wouldn't necessarily work for anyone else in the audience. I do believe in the packet, there actually is a list that they've provided for Pinellas County uh, How to businesses. How choose a contractor. So, so again, that's one place to go, and there are lists on the myflorida.com uh, webpage where you can really research some of this stuff, and or you can contact anyone up here that will say, and most of us, I don't rep a product. I don't only uh, suggest one company. I will say these are three people in the area that I know, or this is what you should be really listening for when folks are talking to you. So even when my, my father went to replace his air conditioners, I said, if that AC guy does not talk to you about manual J's, write, these, write this down, manual J's, he is not the contractor for you. So those little tidbits of what's the right question to ask, and if that contractor can't answer it, then they're not the right one. So it's kind of like that commercial you see with the Carfax and the guys avoiding the question, very similar to that. So there are these little kind of key questions or bits of information, and, and I believe was mentioned before, they shouldn't be trying to necessarily hard sell you on anything. They should be educating you and quite often we go into tons of houses and, and homeowners want the photovoltaic panels and they want solar because it is sexy. And we sit there and we convince them, first you need to really look at the building envelope. First you need to look at changing these light bulbs and the efficiency and then go to the renewable energy. And so we you know, end up convincing people that's not the right way to go. But if it, he's a solar guy and he's in the house, he might just say, yeah, sure, we'll put it on your house. So uh, the best thing to do, there are, I would recommend going to the Florida Green Building site, looking at the, that assessment, because we've really highlighted the low-lying fruit, kind of an intermediate level, and then where you would go if you wanted to engage a contractor. So it really is kind of a three-level tiered process for you. And just for your information, we will be contacting you in a few weeks' time. We'll be providing you with all the links and all the websites that have been mentioned in today's presentation. So don't worry about having to try to remember all these things. We'll provide that for you. And we have a question from the audience. I have three really short ones. The phantom lights that are on almost all of our appliances and stuff, what, what kind of a problem is that in uh, electrical usage? The other is I've read that if you switch lights on and off frequently, that the CFLs are not very efficient. And I go into my closet often during the day to get a pair of shoes, change clothes, do this or that, you know, straighten stuff out. And I'll turn the light on, leave it on for two minutes and shut it off. What's my best choice for that? The same thing in the bathroom. You know, you, I, I keep my shades drawn to keep the sun out in the summer. And so um, most of my rooms are kind of dark, and if I need to read or something, I'll turn the light on and then off frequently. And the third one was, you mentioned you did a house of 2,141 square feet, and you had a two-ton uh, uh, air conditioning unit. I have 2,200 square feet, and when I got a new unit, they came and measured the whole house, and every one of seven or eight contractors told me I needed a four-ton unit. So, <laughs> and which I proceeded to buy because I figured they can't all be wrong, but apparently they were. But my house is a 1969 house. I have kind of low energy bills and I, I'm very conservative in terms of electricity. I mean, my AC is on 78 to 80 all the time and uh, my heat is around 72, 74. So, my highest bill ever was $200. And um, they told me from Florida Power when I had the guy come to insulate my roof, which I'm gonna do uh, to save money next year. But those are the three questions, the phantom things, the incandescent on off, and measuring, how do you tell? Okay, so thank you very much. I'd like uh, Dr. Cantrell to probably take the first shot at the phantom load, if you would, thank you. Well, I think we saw it earlier this morning, um, ranging from perhaps 25 to as much as 50 percent of the of the house's overall energy. What I'm what I'm getting at is that we're we're pretty good with the mechanisms and the energy efficient installations that we have. 
but we're only maybe 50% of the, of the pie or 75% or of it. The, the miscellaneous plug loads, the, the phantom loads, those are the behavioral issues that we none touched on coming out of the gates here on the first question because it's our presumption that, oh yeah, well that's commonsensical, what have you, it's not. It's, it's as much as, when we say toward zero energy, it's toward because you're not gonna get to zero energy. Dr. Languil could do it with a flip of a switch, but the, the point is, those phantom loads are always gonna be there to, to, that's why they call them that. You don't think about them, you don't perhaps know about them, they'll sneak up and, and get you. So I'll spend um, the majority of my career trying to get you answers more toward the phantom loads. Um, and I'll just comment quickly that manual J that was mentioned earlier, um, the different tonnage, what have you, the different HVAC systems, uh, it's not my expertise, but I wouldn't say square footage is the issue of why you would uh, compare a, a certain size HVAC to another one as much as what have you done to the house and the specifics of how the manual J calculations are actually conducted. Thank you, Dr. Cantrell. Gary, do you want to talk about the CFLs and the yes. behavioral with the CFLs? Yeah, with the CFLs, generally, um, what happens when you turn that CFL light bulb on, you should allow it to remain on for approximately five minutes before you turn it off. Uh, an alternative is getting the motion sensors uh, one of the panelists had mentioned, uh, but it, it's kind of like a five minute rule. What happens is when you turn that CFL on and off quickly, for instance, going into the bathroom and leaving within two or three minutes, um, it just degrades the lifetime uh, of the CFL. It doesn't degrade the quality of light. It just degrades the lifetime of the bulb. Thank you, Gary. And Dr. Langwell, I think the last question was directed at something you presented earlier. So uh, it, it is not, you can't assume that the four ton is, is wrong, uh, as was alluded to. It, it, it's not just the square footage of the house. What goes into those manual J calculations is the orientation of the house, the insulation in the walls, the amount of glass to wall area you have, the insulation in the attic space. So all of that goes in to calculate the amount of tonnage that you need. So the challenge is, of course, did they go up in the attic and measure your insulation? Did they look at the walls and or figure out exactly what your insulation values were? Did they figure out your solar heat gain coefficient and U factor of the windows? If they didn't do that and they just saw a four ton and replaced it with a four ton, then that is where a problem would exist. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a uh, fixed grid PV system on the roof, and I'm wondering about the cost of adding to that system, adding more panels versus uh, some kind of tracking system. Do you know what the difference would be uh, in a fixed system versus uh, some kind of tracking system or just adding more panels? Um, yeah. I'll take that one. I, I think uh, a tracking system, what he's talking about is on, on PV panels, the most efficient way for those panels to generate electricity is when they are perpendicular to the sunshine hitting them. So in the morning, a tracking system will actually be on a pivot system that has a motorized system that tracks the sun as it, it goes through the day. And, and during the year, you can tilt them up and down to, to get that maximum amount of energy out of them. Um, I would say if you have a fixed system presently, that you would probably just want to stay with that fixed system. Tracking systems do add a great deal of cost. You have to weigh the consideration of the additional energy that you're going to get versus the cost of putting in a tracking system. Um, but like I say, if, if you have a, uh, an existing system there, I would say just add to it and, and stick with it. Um, the, like I say, the tracking, it, it, does, uh, it does generate more energy over the long run but the, the costs involved are, are rather high. And I mean, if you're starting from scratch, that's a consideration, but to retrofit something, I would say you'd wanna stick with what you got. Thank you, Jeremiah. We have a question. I uh, would just like to uh, ask anyone on the panel, either uh, directly now or any time in the next hour before we convene to uh, perhaps if you, um, believe in this sort of thing, to uh, comment on climate change as a possible motivation for some of the behavioral changes that are really can be low-hanging fruit. I'll just briefly mention my own example. Once I really studied the science of climate change, I made the behavioral changes in my own home and lifestyle that mean that my energy bills run 
from $16 a month to about a, a maximum these days of about $35 to $36 a month. So, uh, but the, the point I'm trying to make is, would any of you care to uh, discuss or comment on climate change as a helpful motivation for all of the things we're talking about doing? Dr. Cantrell, you're nodding your head. Forewarned to uh, tread lightly on this one, so I'll just touch on the, the reason you get a, a, a PhD, those three letters behind your name, is it, it's the, the philosophy of science. It's a methodology to how you approach problems. And I'll, I'll suggest that if somebody proposes a hypothesis and tests it, um, then you might want to look closer at what they're doing. If somebody proposes to open their mouth and whatever, and they don't explore what they're testing or what their hypothesis or what their findings are, and, and they're never going to say, well, we proved this, just, just tread lightly whenever um, somebody starts to talk about it unless they have something that they can sink their teeth in and say, this isn't me, this isn't them, this is the data. And some of us can hide behind data, but generally speaking, the data should speak for itself. Yeah, and that's why I said the science of climate change is close to the politics of climate change. There's a whole lot of politics, smoke and mirrors, but... Uh, that's the part that I'm not talking about this morning by design, but... <laughs> I will make just one quick comment, and that one quick comment would simply be, we know how to do things better now than we did before. We know how to be more resource efficient. We know how to use more energy efficient features. And so regardless of your motivation, if it's to save money or if it is in your opinion to, to save the planet, we don't care why you do it, just do it. And, and I, I kind of, Have we been? Oh, there we go. Um, I, I, I would reflect that also and, and to just consider, uh, you know, what is happening. Energy is not free. Ener there is, there is a, a cost behind it, and there's, there's economic costs, and there's environmental costs, and all that kind of stuff. And, and there are real issues behind that, and, uh, and I'm not afraid to talk about that at all. I, I feel it's incredibly important to, to talk about this issue. And, and, and it would be in a good place to look at that is, is replacing uh, automobiles with electric automobiles. Um, it seems on the surface to be a very good way to do that because we know petroleum is, creates a lot of uh, gases and that kind of stuff. But if we just simply replace uh, fossil fuels with uh, coal burning electricity, there, you, you kind of have to think, well, what are we really trading off here? Just one for the other. And so we have to think about where our energy is coming from on a regular basis. And, and a, a lot of our society in the past 50 years is if you need more energy, you just find a plug and you plug it in, right? I mean, we don't think about where that comes from and the fact that you know, our electric, electricity comes from someplace and if we're taking and removing mountaintops in West Virginia to get to the coal, there is an expense to that. And, and we don't always factor in all those expenses when we're, we're talking about this. Um, you know, we talk about 12 cents a kilowatt for electricity, but we're not talking about what are, what are the environmental costs for doing, creating that energy. And we're not always factoring in the expenses that we do, our health effects and, and our environmental effects and our geopolitical and national security uh, things that happen with that. So it, it is an important issue. And it, and it absolutely is something that we have to think about on a regular basis, on a daily basis, and in our behavior. Thank you, Jerry Meyer. We have a question from the audience. Well, it's not really a question. I uh, just wanted to thank Mr. Samuel. Uh, he headed up the project for Rainbow Village. Yes. Was that you? Yes. And um, so I'd like to thank him for the en energy efficient uh, they did for Rainbow Village um, property. Um, really saving money on my electric bill and just i mean i really just like to thank you for heading up that project it was a great project if i could show my apartment to all y'all i would show y'all the work he did that was a great job so thank you thank you for that thank you. Thank you. samuel would you like to uh, uh would you like to describe that project for us please so i didn't hear say that would again. you like to describe that project for us please uh the, Rainbow Village is a uh, is a uh, housing complex and uh, here locally in Largo that is uh, owned and maintained by the Pinellas County Housing Authority, 
And um, over the last few years, there's been money uh, made available through the Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And uh, here in Pinellas County, it's administered through the Pinellas County Urban League. And they were able to go in and make money available to upgrade or retrofit each one of the apartments there. Uh, which totals about 200 apartments. So we went in and uh, weather eyes put in uh, weather stripping, CO monitors, um, put range hoods in where there that didn't exist before. They had gas gas appliances that weren't properly vented to the outside. They had bathroom fans or you know inexistent bathroom fans uh, for vent you know ventilation. So we were able to go in and just do a in general weatherization package and then also upgrade all the AC systems to a 15 sear um, heat pump system and uh, really made a, a, a big difference in, uh, in all of the apartment, uh, apartments out there. In fact, we're just now getting ready to do another one that's in Dunedin, that's uh, Palm Lake Villas, which is a uh, retirement community in Dunedin. And uh, the same kind of uh, project is going on there. Actually, we started on Monday, so. Thank you, Sam. Uh, one question from the audience. Yeah, um, years ago I installed a solar panel for my water heater, and right now what I'm curious about, because it is older, what's the durability of it? How often should I have it checked? What kind of maintenance? I mean, it's been up there a while, and I, I'm very happy with it, but I need to make sure it stays good. Yeah, um, on, on a typical system, uh, we, we would certainly suggest that you have a plumber or, or, or a, a solar heating contractor come out and take a look at it. Uh, we we expect you know 10 or 15 years out of something like that. Just it's the you have the same kind of problems you have with a, a, your uh, your standard hot water heater, especially if we we live in a place that has a lot of calcium and, and, uh, and chemicals in our water that naturally precipitate out when the water gets heated, and it can corrode and and create problems just like it does with your regular hot water heater. So. Uh, we can go come out and take a look at it and and make sure that it's functioning properly it's not leaking or any other issues with it it's it's like any other appliance it, it does wear out over time and and it, it needs to be replaced at, at some point in the future so but I, I would say you should get at least a 10 to 15 years if not more out of a good hot water system and uh, okay. you know I, I would say every five years you should probably have it like flushed uh, maybe not flushed. Uh, the important thing is to just kind of take a look at it and make sure that water's flowing through it properly and, okay. the, and you, you haven't had calcium buildup inside the pipes that, you know, affect all of our hot, uh, water uh, systems in our homes. I mean, I, I, have a, I live in a uh, 1920s home and I have pipes that have, you know, <laughs> minuscule water flow coming through them that I'm replacing on a regular basis. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I've got one for um, Florida Power. I needed to know... What Something was mentioned about the negative pressure testing. Does Florida Power do that as part of their energy, or Florida Power Progress? You know, do you Progress Energy do that for their um, testing when you guys come out for the homes? That's a great question. We offer the free home energy check to all our customers. They can have that done once every two years, uh, providing that the customer has electric heat and air conditioning and not gas heat. Uh, we're allowed uh, uh, to perform the blower door test. Uh, we have trained certain air conditioning contractors in Pinellas County to be able to perform that test. So when the Progress Energy employee comes out to your house, he'll explain how that test is going to be performed. Uh, he'll provide you with an incentive sheet. As I mentioned earlier, it's $60 for the test per unit. So if you have multiple units in your home, it's going to be a little more money. But assuming you only have one system, it's, it, the test is $60, Progress pays for 30 of it. While you're in your home, we will set that appointment with that contractor so we can leave you with a contact phone number and the name of the company that's coming out. Uh, when they come out, they will install the blower door uh, and uh, perform the test for $30. Uh, they'll go through your entire duct system and identify any leaks and give you an estimate along with a diagram drawing. If you decide that you want that system fixed, it has to be done by a Progress Energy certified contractor because we have to be able to reinspect 10% of the uh, repairs that are done. Um, but we'll set that appointment for you. It'll be tested, the diagram will be drawn out, and uh, as I mentioned, $150, the first $150 is paid by Progress Energy. Thank is you, Gary. Okay. Well, like one more question from the audience. We have somebody here, and then I've got a question for Richard, and then we'll take a break. Is that all right with everybody? 
We'll, we'll have another panel discussion, the same panelists, and your opportunities to ask questions. So please, sir, your question. Kind of an odd question. Uh, due to neurological problems, I cannot use complex fluorescent light bulbs in my house. Love to go to LED bulbs, but can't find a source uh, that uh, one reliable so I can get the, a, a consistent bulb or anything that comes out with enough uh, lumens out of it. Is there a guideline I should be following or some place I should be going to try to find more information on the LED bulbs so I can actually make some progress towards that? Gary, do you want to answer that question? I would probably suggest um, you know, you can start with Home Depot, Lowe's, some of your hardware stores, but unfortunately, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, but there are lighting stores in the area that I would recommend going because they deal a lot with commercial and residential customers. And uh, um, I believe they'd be able to uh, uh, answer your questions and order the correct bulbs. Uh, I'd, I'd also say that uh, there's quite a few um, internet companies out there right now dealing in this. It is an emerging technology. So, you know, the, the mainstream, it, it is not fallen into the mainstream of your whole uh, Home Depot and Lowell's, but the internet is, is full of uh, uh, those kind of retail places that are dealing, can deal on a much more national level. And perhaps we can talk in the second panel about LEDs, that technology, how the price is coming down, and how it's more expensive to replace an incandescent with an LED than perhaps to start over again, and in your situation, you might want to just redo the lighting system in your house, given, given that situation. That might be a suggestion that we could uh, pursue in the next panel. But uh, to finish up with our first panel discussion, uh, Richard, you are our, uh, our guinea pig. You are the one in the county who you've been through it all, you've done the retrofits, and you've even gone beyond into solar. Can you just describe for a, a few minutes now before our break, um, what that process was like, and would you do it again? And the ups and downs, and ins and outs, and, and um, in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, first, the, the first question, the answer is yes. Uh, the second question, the answer is yes, I'm doing it again. Uh, but in the first 5K system, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, that was priced at $39,000. Went through the federal tax we got the, the, the incentive on that of $11,000 for that. Uh, the state, unfortunately, well, to put it lightly, kind of screwed us uh, with the uh, $2 watt return rebate that was supposed to be available. So uh, we were expecting 20000 and we got zip for the first one. Now, that being said, uh, we'd already committed to the system. So uh, mortgage rates had hit a, a record low at that time, we refied at the same number of years, at the same payment, actually slightly less, and finished paying off the system last year. Uh, we are right now presently, uh, we got the Fed back, uh, and we also, what was the, uh, the secondary? Well, we actually are getting back from the state now today, but uh, only 10,000 of the 20 which is going towards the second system. And the price has dropped to 33, the same K voltage. So the systems are actually coming down in price. The options to finance are also increasing. Uh, right now we're getting the 10 back from the Fed, we're getting 11 back from the Fed, 10 from the rebate, and uh, we're working on the Progress Energy distribution benefit that is gonna be available in October that is going to be another 10,000, making that 31,000 of 33. And we've already put 1,000 down for the evaluation by our contractor at 32, which is gonna be deducted from the system. So the next 5K system, which is gonna put us at net zero, we're gonna be producing more electricity than we're using, is gonna be $1,000. And these programs are available, by the way, to every citizen. And if I can do it, and I'm an average 40 hour a week person, you can do it. The higher you go in seasonal energy efficiency ratings, the more efficient the unit is. And the codes have changed in Florida now to where the minimum code is 13. So we have a program that if a customer 
decides to go 14 sear or 15 sear, um, will actually incentivize the customer up to $350, providing they have the home energy check first. Obviously, that has to be a heat pump because in the winter months, if a customer is using a straight heat cool system with strip heat, that's roughly 10 kW. Our rates right now are around 13 cents a kilowatt. So that would be $1.30 for every hour you try to heat your home. Well, if you have a heat pump, you reduce that to 3 kilowatts per hour, which you know is, is 40 cents, give or take. The way I've, I've slated this is we have kind of that Home Depot, Lowe's, big box home improvement store. What can I go buy myself, do myself? that's low cost, that'll have a good financial return. Then we've tiered it to be a little bit, okay, what's the next step? I might have to engage a contractor. Where do I get the money to do that if I want to go to that level? So we have that $50 solution, that $500 solution, and that $5,000 solution for folks. With energy conservation, uh, many times it's a very simple solution. People don't realize it's very basic, simple things that they can do every day along with personal practices that can really save big money in the long term.